Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is View from the North, uh, featuring our special guest, Dr. Ken Rogers and Kelowna, British Columbia. Welcome to the show, Ken. Hello, Jay. We're going to talk today about energy. Will energy profits obstruct our efforts on dealing with climate change? We seem to be heading in the wrong direction. And I know you have many thoughts about that. So why don't you scope out our discussion, and then I'll give you my input also. Well, I think that when you uh, have to look at energy and uh, solving the climate crisis, you have to think from a worldwide perspective. If you look at the United States, um, you know, generally the United States has been a net importer of oil and a net importer of gas. Um, and, but over the years, uh, the U.S. has cleaned up its environmental act somewhat. You've had significant economic growth, which takes more energy. Um, but you've had uh, a reduction in the amount of the use of coal in particular. And the use of coal has generally been replaced by natural gas. The All of the um, wind and solar uh, energy really has roughly equaled the rate of growth or the, the growth in the economy, or you really have two factors that have added to the uh, power mix or energy mix. You've had more natural gas and you've had more less coal, but you've had more wind and solar. Now, if you stand back and take the world, uh, in the last year, the world used more coal to produce electricity than it did the year before, and it used more last year than it did the year before that. You know, that that the rest of the world is going backwards pretty fast. You have the major population centers, India and China in particular, uh, even though China is a main developer of solar and wind and their and hydro you know their population um increase in standard of living has increased the amount of energy they're using at a very phenomenal rate you know the us this um right now has a pretty nice growth rate going well, that's a nice growth rate if you're comparing that with Western Europe and and Canada and Mexico and Australia. But if you're comparing that with, you know, China and India and Indonesia and and the very large population countries in the East, uh, you know, really the U.S. is not growing very fast at all relative to the rest of the world. So if we're going to solve the climate crisis, and I believe that's a, a very important thing to do, you have to watch what you have in energy security. And, you know, to have the best example of some of the what not to do's is to look at Germany. You know, right now, Germany is suffering uh, economically. Uh, you know, they have, let's call it a mild recession. However, uh, one of the key causes of all of that has been the extreme increase in the price of their energy. You know, they have the farmers, you know, rolling their tractors down the highways and blocking things because, you know, their their economics have gone down the drain purely because of the change in the price of energy. Well, let me jump in on that now, Ken. Um, it seems to me the most important story in our lifetime, which we do not acknowledge generally, uh, is climate change. It's, a, it's, it's it's going to ruin the world. It is ruining the world. And I blame the media for telling us that there's fires and floods here and there and everywhere, but they don't connect it up, not in the public mind, but climate change. That's exactly what's happening. It is happening everywhere. You, you know, we style the show about corporate profits, uh, energy company, oil and gas company, uh, corporate profits. And indeed, those guys have, uh, just like tobacco, another couple of decades ago, um, an initiative to try to dull the senses, um, you know, on public policy about the connection between climate change 
and oil and gas and so forth. Um, and I think they stand in the way politically of dealing with uh, climate change. Also, as you said, you know, there's a, there's a connection between the economies of various countries all around the world um, and uh, their efforts at uh, dealing with climate change. If the economy needs more energy and growing economies always do, or efficient economies always do, um, then, you know, the problem is that we don't pay attention to climate change. We pay attention to cheaper energy, and that stands in the way. Um, so then you have misinformation, disinformation. You have a, a confusion of priorities. Um, and social media does not help because people don't understand the existential nature of climate change. We are distracted. Um, you know, look what happened with the Maui fire. The Maui fire is very ironic. It's it's the product of, of climate change, uh, although the press doesn't dwell on that. And we are distracted from further efforts at dealing with climate change because of the effects of climate change. You know, it's so interesting and it's so ironic. Uh, electric vehicles are really not going where they should go. Hawaii still has a very small number percentage-wise. It's a drop in the bucket, and I think it's a drop in the bucket in many places and countries. I blame the media for all of this. I blame the educational system for all of this. People don't see it, not from K-12 K to higher education. They don't see it. They'd rather protest about what's going on in the Middle East on campus, uh, but they don't protest about climate change. Now, you and I are old enough to know that 20 years ago, there was a lot of protest about climate change and the environment and all that. What happened to that? Now we protest about the Middle East. Um, organizations that were dedicated to dealing with climate change have gone off the side. To wit, here in Hawaii, we had a, a thing called Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. It's all but dead right now. And uh, we've watched that. And it's sad that there was all this energy about energy. Now there's no energy about energy. The EPA is um, you know, not helping in terms of dealing with the environment. Uh, the COF 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 is on a decline every single year. And I say COF, I mean COP. The COP 21 conference of parties that's supposed to deal with climate change and, and evoke a collaborative response. And um, they, haven't, they haven't been doing it. People have not been going even or contributing. International organizations like the United Nations, it's a failure on climate change. In general, around the world, people don't know or care, and it's they don't know and they don't care. It's less interest, less caring than before. And government in this country is locked up. It can't do anything. Even if Joe Biden really cares about climate change, he's not going to be able to get anything through. And government is not spending enough money. It's not addressing this as an emergency which is what it is. COVID got in the way. Science is not being funded, not to the same extent as before, even a few years ago. And yes, we're still using coal and oil and gas. We, we called it a bridge fuel. How about a permanent fuel? That's what it is. And so what, you know, what's happening is all the plans to deal with climate change have been undermined or forgotten. Um, our efforts and alternative fuels like wind, algae, uh, burning garbage and all that, it's out. And you see greater and greater uh, opposition in the communities by way of NIMBY, not my backyard. They don't want to have anything in their backyard, even if on a global basis it's important to do that. The city planners don't concentrate on it. Transportation um, organizers and planners don't co concentrate on it. And, and political initiatives, you know, who exactly in this election year um, has a meaningful platform plank on climate change. People don't care. And geopolitically, people don't care. Countries don't care. We're too busy fighting wars. We're too busy trying to take over the neighbor. Our tax incentives sit here and elsewhere and globally do not favor efforts at climate change. I, I need to spend the money. I do need to spend the money on Guns, weapons, and profits. I just need to interrupt you to say that uh, it it must be a gloomier feel in Hawaii than it is in Western Canada. Certainly here we have uh, an awful lot of climate protests. Um, you know, the, cli the uh, climate problem really is 
front and center in Canada to the to the extent that they're making stupid decisions. You know, um, you know, part of it is thinking that as if Canada were an island and it had no connection to the rest of the world. You know, where uh, to me, you need to use uh, in the long run. You've got to have a lot of nuclear energy to. Uh, deal with uh, to deal with the need for adequate um, energy total, and you need a lot of it. And importantly, you've got to in the interim you need to start knocking off the worst um, creators of CO two and uh, <clears throat> and methane. And uh, the first one would be coal. You know, well, so far. Um, the um, speed with which we're adding wind, solar, and having increase in natural gas, mainly because of LNG, they have been able to sort of together uh, handle essentially the rate of growth and and getting rid of coal. You know, but it, they really need more of them. For example, I think that Biden has had a, a recent policy thing to uh, slow down the United States' ability to export LNG. From a world climate solution scenario, that is insane. That is really stupid. What's good for Putin, you know, is what he just did. And and all you have to do is look at Germany and say, what are they going to do? Are they going to let the lights turn off, or are they going to take the take the fuel from Putin? They call him Putin, but that uh, it's kind of the uh, synonym that uh, suits the guy. However, <clears throat> I think that um, you know you've got to phase out natural gas. But it'll be quite a while to do it. So you have to deal with things like carbon capture and the sequestration of CO2. Uh, in Canada, we have a, a mega project uh, to uh, sequester all of the um, CO2 created by all of the oil sands. Um, now, the oil sands are now producing, you know, a, a huge amount of oil, uh, and it's much cleaner than regular oil produced in Nigeria or Angola or Libya, but it's still not clean enough. And, um, you know, Canada's policies are, are the federal government's pushing that cleanup uh, faster than, you know, um, China is able to reduce the use of coal. I kind of connect those. Here, but I'm reminded by... You know, we, we have a, a, an exigent situation. We have an emergency, call it a human emergency, global human emergency, and we're really not doing anything. There's a movie um, last year, year before, called Don't Look Up, and it was about a, a, an asteroid that was going to come and destroy the Earth. And these guys were talking about the price of instant coffee at the local food shop, food store. And you say, wait a minute, wait, uh, what about the priorities? Is the price of instant coffee more important than than the destruction of the earth. And I could list a hundred issues in this country alone where, where people think of those issues and it's more important. We are living in an emergency and frankly, and, and I would like you to discuss this, and frankly, everyone has to, um, everyone has to sacrifice. The oil companies, the gas companies, uh, every household in order to survive the planet and we, you know, including Germany, they have to sacrifice their economies. They have to sacrifice having, you know, the kind of energy they want to have all day. They have to back off until we straighten this out. Don't you agree? Um, I think that's a little idealistic. Uh, I mean, in an academic sense, I can understand what you're saying. In a practical sense, I have a little trouble saying uh, that, uh, well, we should tell all the world to stop increasing their GDP. Like, like slow down, no, no increases in, in anything that will expand the use of energy. 
Now we want everybody to turn off the heat or turn down the heat. Let's have nobody take warm showers. You've got to have a cold shower only. You know, change change all your habits. Like if you want to overnight solve the climate crisis, you can list about 20 things of that sort, and they would probably work. Like tell everybody in Africa, go back to subsistence living. Don't aspire to any improvement to have any standard of living that looks anything like Europe or North America. Just, you know, stay in a hole. You know, and, you know, China, stop growing. And India, you know, just stop, stop any expansion of your economy. Well, that just didn't get to work. No, but the alternative is, you know, destruction of the species. We're going to have more floods, more fires, more, more catastrophes around the world, and many, many people will die. So it's a Sophie's choice. And well, what I was saying is it's, it's, a, it's a dilemma. It's a dilemma for world policy. The problem is we don't have a way to determine world policy one way or the other or in the middle. Um, and, I, you know, it's a, it's a choice that could, if we do nothing, that's the test. If we do nothing, which we are largely doing now, maybe Canada is doing more than the U.S., but globally we're doing very little. And, the, and the, in making that choice, we are dooming a good part of global population um, to be destroyed by climate change. What do we do? Well, an interesting one, just a little bit of a side post. Because of climate change, Canada has had a phenomenal amount of wildfires. Well, last year, the, what, the CO2 created by the wildfires um, added more CO2 to the atmosphere than did the Canadian industrial side of the, of, um, of the Canada Canadian population. That is what the world statistics show for Canada as a contributor to CO2. We're probably about the, about the 15th largest contributor to CO2 in the world. Uh, but, uh, that's only counting, um, you know, the human activity. Well, last year's forest fires added more CO2 than the rest of the Canadian economy. You know, so the climate change itself is being self-cumulative. Similarly, you know, in, in the Canadian North, um, uh, as, is, as is also the case for all of Siberia, you know, the permafrost is freezing and the methane that's been captured in the permafrost is starting to to leak through and into the atmosphere. And, and methane is uh, far more potent as a uh, greenhouse gas than is um, uh, CO2. By the way, uh, uh, most people don't know that, that natural gas... The, the chemical formula for natural gas is H2CO4, and that's just, that's methane. Like, that is the chemical formula for methane. That is, natural gas is methane. So whenever natural gas is being shipped anywhere, you know, you have to be really careful that the pipes don't leak or or anything of that sort. And, and when you're extracting it, how much is escaping into the air and this is where, you know, the Canadian industry has, has really been pulling up their socks is when you have a natural gas well, they never flare it out. It Like flaring a gas well or flaring an oil well, wherever you see those flames at the top, they're just burning off methane. That's worse, far worse than that in CO2. So, you know, you can, you can have those practices to capture CO2 and capture methane at their sources and sequester it. You know, that's a, a major item that Canada's doing. That's where we felt that in Canada, or at least politically, that you cannot keep the economy rolling at all if you don't continue to have some oil and gas. But how can you have the oil and gas used to help the economy go without increasing any 
CO2 or methane into the atmosphere. It's so biblical. It's, this is biblical. It's the destruction, our our own suicidal destruction of our civilization. You know, you can say that Canada is better than the U.S. Um, you can say that Hawaii, if Hawaii tried much, right? <laughs> <laughs> if if Hawaii tried really hard to do all the initiatives that have been discussed in futility over the past uh, 20, 30 years, um, if you could take uh, Al Gore and, and put him in charge, maybe he would do more. But that's only one country or two countries. We have 192 countries in the world, or maybe 200 countries in the world, and, and we have to get them all together on uh, the sacrifice that's necessary to save the planet. And we're not doing that. We're not close to doing that. In fact, it's, it's slipping down the chain of priorities. Well, the Europeans were ahead of Canada and the U.S., you know, and, and that's where you know, in all their enthusiasm, the Germans, uh, you know, shut off the nuclear plants thinking, well, gee, in the long run, they, they, you know, you have nuclear waste and that's not a good thing environmentally. So while we're on this route of rah-rah for the climate, let, let's not even have nuclear and, and let's use Russian gas instead of our local coal. You know, and and that seemed to be working for a little while. A German economy was uh, going along, and then um, <clears throat> uh, all of a sudden, you know, the Russian gas, the pipes were shut off for a little bit of Putin leverage, and suddenly, uh, you know, reality came in, saying, "Gee, we need practical ways to do this." Where security has two dimensions you need military security or like to keep putin in his hole uh but you also need your your sort of economic security you know like you know do you uh, where's your energy security while you do this you know and you can say is it a good plan to slow down growth well, the population, no politician would do that. It's kind of a loop, isn't it? If you don't pay attention to the economy and people um, lose a certain part of their quality of life, then they're going to vote the bums out of office. And uh, you're going to have a new crowd in there running things. And, and their platform is going to be, we don't care about climate change. Uh, we want everybody to have a better quality of life. The other aspect is a guy named, uh, not like Putin, um, he cares about taking over his neighbors. He cares about war. He cares about weapons. He cares about dealing with the sanctions. He doesn't care about climate change. He doesn't give a rip about the methane escaping through the permafrost. He doesn't care about that. Well, that's so, exactly the point of, of it is a combination of priorities. You can't say we must have a climate change priority and to hell with everything else. You know, or you can't say, let's make the economy grow like crazy because the economy will get more votes and let's ignore everything else. Um, you, there, you need a combination of things. If the economy is going well and the public is happy, they will make sacrifices that they would otherwise not make. Um, they will make investments in things for the long-term future they would not otherwise do. You know, and so the, you know, upset of the German economy when the Russians shut off the gas, you know, shows really, you know, that you've got to keep the economy rolling. You've got to keep the public happy in order to achieve your long-term objectives. And the happier they are, the more they will allow. I mean, you know, you have naysayers about, adding, you know, the new types of nuclear power. And and yet, you know, I can't think of any way that we're ever going to solve the climate trace crisis without a ton of nuclear power. Oh, I want to add uh, to that that we have, in the state of Hawaii, our legislature is in session right now. Um, and there are two bills, count them, two bills that call for nuclear power. Um, now, we have a provision in the Constitution is you can't have nuclear power without a certain 
super majority um, of of votes in the legislature, um, and that's and that's um, that's important. That was well motivated back in the whenever it is uh, the seventies or the sixties. Um, but but the fact is that these bills are not going to pass. Um, it was a noble idea to introduce them. Maybe this will happen elsewhere. But I totally agree with you, Ken. Without nuclear power, we lose in the calculus. In other words, our efforts are not enough to keep keep up with the uh, the advance of of climate change. We'll have to move faster, and the only way we can move fast enough is with nuclear power. That's my thought. Well, one might say, is Hawaii a good place for nuclear power? So let me use a good example. Would you have a nuclear power station at the south end of the Big Island? Not bloody likely. You know, that is, if you're going to have nuclear power, you got to say, well, gee, I think Kauai would be a really safe place, <laughs> or safer, you know, but, uh, you know, lots of places, you know, are less safe than others. As Fukushima just proved, you know, you can't put nuclear power anywhere near Hilo. You know, you're going to have the Fukushima equivalent someday. You know, a, a tsunami will roll in like they've done for hundreds of years into the Hilo area. So you have to pick... Um, where where you're going to have some of these, uh, you know, the southeast U.S. has just a ton of nuclear power stations that they've been running for years. They're doing well, um, but the the new type of nuclear is is you know really pretty pretty good, and uh, and you know the world is generally considering it. But like you say, your legislature in Hawaii is plodding away, and it's going very slowly. In the U.S., federal legislations in gridlock, or let's call it Republican denial, that they have a duty to to approve anything. You know that they're supposed to do the job that they were elected to do. Um, <clears throat> however, um, I think that that the public is pretty conscious of climate change and that politicians in the press need to keep beating that drum, but they need, you know, comprehens more comprehensive solutions, not isolated solutions, you know, just a single shot things are not too terrific. Um, I think the, um, one of the few things that, that I might agree with that Trump has said was drill, 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 I should have said, but I would qualify that, you know, drill for natural gas so you can ship LNG to Europe uh, so that they do not have to take Russian gas and therefore cause military problems, like that side of security. And that starts to give the Europeans economic security. I mean, Germany has always been the Germany and Britain, the key engines of, of economic activity in Europe, and, and Germany's floundering right now, and it's got a a scary rise in the, you know, far right political side of Germany because of the, you know, what most of the world would think is a minor economic uh, setback, you know, but Biden, instead of cutting off the LNG should have been standing on his head saying, Germany, we're coming, we're helping. You know, please be patient. We're pumping as fast as we can, you know, and, and encourage, uh, you know, a lot more. Well, at the end of the day, it's political because no leader, at least in the Western world, democratic world, is going to take a, a step that's going to have him thrown out of office. And if, you know, if it's a dangerous politically, he's going to be very tentative about doing it. And so our, our system itself is being tested at the global system, the United Nations and all kinds of international organizations, they're being tested. And the, and the, the world itself is being tested to see if we can come together, determine smart policy, execute the policy, pay for the policy, make the necessary sacrifices uh, to achieve the policy. And, and thus beat off climate change. 
But I don't think we're even close to that, Ken. And it may not happen in our lifetimes, maybe the next generation. We're going to find more storms, more floods, and more effects of climate change, and more deaths resulting from the advance of climate change. And I don't know at what point we realize that we really got to take global action. Your thoughts? Um, I agree with you on that. I mean, I, I think of, you get funny extremes, like, um, you know, a major contributor to CO2 uh, are, is the airline industry. Mm. Well, how do you, you can't run an airplane of the size and weight that we have on electrical batteries. You know, you you really need something like hydrogen. You know, well, you know, if you deal with it as a combined problem, like how do you solve, keep the ec economy going, that is, we want airplanes in the air, We, but we don't want to have them use a liquid fuel uh, that's going to put CO2 or methane into the air. So do you find, you know, in the middle of a desert somewhere or in the top of some mountains that uh, that nobody's there, you're using wind or solar to generate, uh, to actually to create hydrogen. You know, because hydrogen's an expensive fuel right now, but but it's one of the solutions. Can you lower the cost of solar and wind so you can put them in remote, unused locations. You know, uh, like, you know, what part of the Hawaiian islands is unused? Well, how about the islands that are closer to Japan than Kauai, you know, that are just barely sticking out of the ground? What, you know, can you put there that can produce enough power to create a fuel that can substitute for what you are using, starting with coal, then kick off oil, then kick off natural gas. I mean, burning garbage is still, you know, you may be getting, you know, solving the landfill problem, but you're not, you're, you're creating uh, methane and, and other noxious fumes. You know, there's, other than CO2, there's some things that are worse than, CO2. True. But we, you know, we used to think that geothermal could be expanded, but it hasn't been a lot of political resistance then and now about geothermal. And uh, and, we, and we used to think that we could uh, transmit energy um, by, by cable among the islands and bring the islands together on one sort of major grid. But um, we that ran into trouble and it became politically radioactive. Uh, we have to think that we could have wind uh, offshore the way uh, Europe has wind in the North Sea, um, but there's resistance to that too on the basis, actually, that it doesn't look good. So what I'm saying is over the past 20 years, where think tech anyway and, and various environmental people and organizations have been thinking about this, um, the interest politically has declined in this state. You can find some people still excited about it, but the, the action points have declined. And I, I just feel that we're going to have to learn the hard way. Well, you mentioned geothermal. Uh, you know, what have you, are you familiar with the term engineered geothermal? No. On that, if essentially, if you go to deep oil wells or oil and gas wells, like down Texas, Louisiana, you got some 10, 12,000 foot wells and the heat of the uh, ground at that depth is is pretty great in a lot of parts of the world such as hawaii there's a large you know hot spot in the earth rolling along underneath the islands which are creating the kilauea's and eventually one you know further along than kilauea um well this um Engineered geothermal, the idea is with advanced capabilities in drilling where you can drill down, you know, you could drill down and just make a U-turn, you know, drill down and let's just simplify and say I have a U, a U-shaped pipe where I make it almost like a big U 
with a flat bottom. And, and that bottom of that is at a depth that it's really hot. And you simply have, you put down a working fluid in the pipe. You never have it touch the ground underneath. It never create, collects any, you know, of the noxious uh, chemicals that may be in the ground at 10,000 feet or 12,000 feet or, you know, some area. And uh, you simply have, you're heating that working fluid and bringing it up and using it at the top to produce your your power, you know, produce electricity. Now, you know, this is a really good point you make. We're almost out of time, but I, I just want to, I want to capture that point, if you will. <clears throat> it's unlikely that we're going to see international organizations uh, rise to, rise to solve the problem. Sorry to say, and um, you know, if they don't, uh, you know, we're at greater risk every single day. But <clears throat> technology can help. The technology of this engineered, uh, you know, geothermal is a good example. I think the technology of batteries that are light and could actually, uh, you know, uh, fuel planes. Um, the technology of, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe hydrogen fueling planes. All these things have to be. They have to be uh, explored and solved. And uh, you know, if you talk to the average scientist working on any of this. He is a very, or she is a very frustrated person because they don't believe that people care. They don't believe that people are will and governments are willing to pay the price for that research into technology. But I suggest to you, Ken, that the te technology that would make nuclear safer, the, the technology that would work on, on hydrogen and engineered geothermal and wind in places where uh, you know, the NIMBY community wouldn't object to it so much, and laying down cables, all of this um, has been essentially stopped by the cost and the political resistance to the cost. Um, but if we could just get some good technology working in all of these things, the technology people and companies and investors would be the leaders. So we have got to get the oil companies, um, you know, to stop misinforming us about climate change and start uh, really doing some investment in technology. That would be, that's my closing point to you anyway, that would be a, a practical solution. As a Canadian, I smile when you talk about uh, oil companies misinforming where you have a candidate, you know, for president of the United States that's probably the worst uh, I have ever heard of in terms of misinforming the public. It's not the press. I mean, it, the press that quotes whatever the idiot says, you know, may be guilty, but, uh, you know, certainly the idea of of um, it ought to be a crime to have such a degree of or magnitude of misinformation on subjects that are as crucial as climate change. Okay, great point. And on that note, I think we'll have to we'll have to stop. Um, we're out of time. Uh, Dr. Ken Rogers, a uh, retired Canadian businessman in Kelowna, British, Colum British Columbia, giving us the view from the north on so many important issues. Thank you, Ken. Aloha, aloha from Kelowna. Aloha again. Take care.